How's the weather there in Seattle, Washington there, Robin King? Uh, it's a little gray today, but it's beautiful. It's Is not it, raining. It, it's not raining? Not raining. Yeah. It's, uh, no, it's not very chilly. Oh, okay. Yeah. Welcome, Braves. You're here in between Seattle, Washington and San Diego, California, on the spot where the conversation is pointed, guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. You know, unfortunately, Brains, too many of us give up, give in, and quit. What is the culture of quitting? Is it that you don't have the tenacity, that you don't have the courage, that you don't have the money, that you don't have the mindset, or you don't have the discipline? Because it takes discipline to stick to it, okay? And so we have a great, great teacher here. My neighbor over there, Robin Keen. She's from Seattle, Washington. She is not only a coach that works with parents and adults to stop the culture of quitting, but also she's a great music teacher. So we're going to talk about that and all things Robin Keen. Welcome her to the edge. Good morning, Robin. Morning, April. It's delightful to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to have you here. And this is really, a, you know, a very basic, simplistic conversation, but it is so prevalent. So many people give out and give up. So let's dial back a little bit. Tell us a little bit about who you are, uh, what you do, and then fast forward us to stop quitting. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, I'm a mom of four kids. They're all just about grown now. My last one is a senior in high school and um, they're off in the world doing great things. Uh, and I'm up here in Washington where I've lived for over 25 years, um, native of Northern California, but I'm up here now. And so for me, the whole thing about quitting goes all the way back to growing up with my mom and dad. My mom uh, was a teacher and my dad was an airline captain and they were both perfectionists and they had a huge value on Finishing what I started and so it's it, it began for me as a child I took Suzuki violin and I stuck with that until I was 10 and then I took piano and There was never an option for me to quit and I I wanted to do those things But certainly I went through times where I did want to quit like anything, right? Um, and I remember, you know, making commitments to babysit. I, I had a huge babysitting business as a teenager. And I remember I wanted out of that sometimes. I, you know, would commit to babysitting and then I'd get off, asked out on a date. And my parents were like, mm -hmm. no, no, you're, you're babysitting. Like, we're not going to cover for you. You're going to have to do it. I remember that one specifically with one boy who I really liked. I finally, he asked me out and I had to tell him no because I was babysitting. Oh my God. Yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> I still remember. So apparently it was a big deal. Right. But yeah. But I brought that mindset into my marriage and into having kids. And when my first daughter was uh, three and a half, she was in preschool and I knew the teachers and I knew the school and she loved to go and she just was having a great time. And then one day she didn't want to go. And I thought, well, that's weird. And I, you know, I took her temperature and there wasn't anything wrong, but she really didn't want to go. And so I didn't take her and then it happened again and then it happened again and I get her already and she had a, I had a newborn as well at the time and you know get everybody ready to go out the door and Madeline lays on the floor and has this huge fit and finally I went to her teacher and I said okay I don't get it like what's going on um, you know she's happy when she's here but getting her here is really difficult and her teacher said something to me that really impacted the rest of my child raising years which was if you value this activity for her and she is safe, you're the adult, you get to choose. She's too little to make a decision about what's good for her. And it was a turning point for me. I went, oh, I've, I've got to be, I've got to adult here, you know? And I, uh, right. I so um, fast forward, I had a music and dance school in a little town on the Olympic Peninsula called Squim. And uh, it started, you know, with 15 students and grew to around 500. And I watched a particular thing happen over and over again with parents, which was they'd enroll their child. And three or four or five weeks later, two, week, two months later, they'd come in and say, we're, we're going to withdraw. And I remember one mom came to the front desk and was talking to my receptionist. And she said, I'm withdrawing my child. And I couldn't even see her child. She was somewhere. And um, she said she doesn't like fairy tale ballet anymore. 
And Laura said, well, what's wrong with it? She said, oh, she's bored. And I looked around past the mom and there's this little tiny four-year-old standing there. And I thought, oh no, here we go. The wow. four-year-old is telling mom what she's gonna do. And, um, and so that, it just became like a, a wow for me. Like here we are, this is what's happening. And what we know is that whatever we establish when kids are little is what they believe is the truth and how things are done from that point on. Right. So kids grow up thinking, oh, you know, the next shiny object, oh, there's the next class, there's the next class, and it's endless. Then what happens to them when they're in school and they've got a group project that they don't want to do or they have a teacher they don't like or they're in kind of some kind of sport or activity where they just don't feel like doing it anymore? What happens is they never do it. They never really achieve anything. And what happens for us in that is that we lose confidence. We are not gaining confidence. We're not gaining skills. We're not growing our self-esteem. We start to see that, gosh, I'm not good at anything. I really can't finish anything. So it sets something up really early that is not serving our kids. Right? Well, and it's so funny that you said that because <laughs> my daughter was one of those when she was um, in high school. Mm -hmm. Oh, my math teacher, he doesn't like me. And he's this and he's that and he's this. Well, I had a surprise for her. Who came to dinner? Oh, oh yes. Oh. There was a knock on the door and it was her math teacher. That's awesome. And, and, and I mean, all the, the color just drained out of her face. And I said, you know what? This is an opportunity for you guys to get to know each other. Well, you know, and, and to bond and have a conversation over a meal, which is great meditation. Mm -hmm. Long story short, she got an A in the class. Wow. Because he said the same thing you said. It's uh, a discipline. You have to stick to it. You have to stick with anything that you start until it is just unbearable or you don't see that there is any uh, benefit to it or you're totally distracted. So, it's, so that's crazy. So tell us a little bit um, about the music and, and what type of music you play and you teach at your music school and music academy. And now is it a music and dance academy or just yeah. music? Music and dance, yes. Wow. Uh, and so I had that for a, a couple of decades, and I sold it a few years ago to my one of my dear friends who was my business partner. But in that school, so I teach a, a, a method of piano called Simply Music. It's from Australia, and you play first and read later. And so it just, you know, goes right to your natural musicality, which I absolutely love. And I've had hundreds of students that have all had a really amazing results. But part of my training um, to teach that method was from a, a brilliant guy named Neil Moore, who developed the program, and he has a great understanding of the human condition and human psychology, and he taught, he teaches all of the teachers that come on board that, look, playing the piano requires a long-term relationship, and any long-term relationship has peaks, valleys, and plateaus that last for short, medium, and long times, mm. and they're always changing, and so... In my studio, we require that every child in piano had their parent present because we wanted them to understand that their kid was definitely going to hit a valley or a plateau and that we could coach them through that. There was nothing wrong with their child. There was nothing wrong with them, nothing wrong with the method or the teacher. And so that when they understood that, when their child had, you know, hit that place of, I don't like it, I don't want to go, they were like, no problem. We've committed and you're going to get through this because this is just wow. normal. And so we had tremendous, um, a tremendous impact on the students in our studio, in particular, the piano students. Not as much with the dance students because I wasn't teaching dance. I taught fitness, but not dance. But, you know, we worked with our teachers to help them understand so they could talk to the parents. So, you know, we retained students for years and years because we were constantly having that conversation with their parents. So it normalized this, this up and down of loving it, not loving it, right? Because right. that is the way life works in, in everything. Jobs, marriage, raising children. Like, was I happy every single day? I had four kids. Right. Are you there know? Do you want to walk out and quit? Absolutely. Right. There were moments, certainly. So when you get to that place, mm -hmm. let's talk to some adults here. Okay? Because the kids, first of all, uh, who's the parent, like you said? Mm -hmm. Okay? You don't want to force your child to do anything. Right. What I think that we have done is that we have really kind of um, dumbed down mm -hmm. our parental rights. 
I mean, I remember when I was uh, going to elementary school, you came home, you put your book bag down, you got you something to eat, you washed your hands. There was no going outside playing till that homework was done. Yeah. Uh, you know, you ate your dinner, you cleaned up your plate. Now it's an act of Congress to get them to eat something civilized for a meal. It's all this negotiating. I don't right. negotiate with no kids, okay? Yeah. This is what it, this is, what it is. I am the adult. Sometimes I'm going to give them some leverage and sometimes I'm going to let them have some say-so because you want them to have an opinion. You right. want them to be able to make choices and right. to be involved in their life. But uh, bottom line is I'm the adult. Okay, so now I'm the adult with the challenge. And I don't like my boss and my boss doesn't like me and I don't like my job and I don't like my mate. Mm -hmm. What do we do when we're stuck in a place like that, Robin? So... I want to address that, and then I want to address the other side of the coin, and you kind of just alluded to it. But look, when, when we've got something we don't like, we have a choice to make, right? And so when I get to a place like that, I have an evaluation of, okay, and it's the same thing for parents. Like, what if we're talking about kids and activities, I'm just going to flip back to that for a second. Mm -hmm. So one thing you mentioned was, you know, you're the boss, but here's the thing, you have to be present to be the boss. And I think right now we struggle with presence. Um, I was in an event this weekend, and it was a very focused group. We were really paying attention to what was happening in the room. But I've been in other events where people are on their phones. You know, they're just not present to what's happening. And unfortunately, that's happening a lot with between parents and children, is we are now using electronic devices to distract our kids or to distract ourselves or to distract our kids when we want to be distracted, right? So we're, there's just not this awareness and presence going on. And that's the first step in the Raising Quit Proof Kids roadmap is be present. Like, don't even bother. If you can't be present, then don't go through the program because there won't be a point. You've got to know what's going on. Um, so the first, the second step is to evaluate the activities and know why you're doing them or why you want your child to do them for how long with what outcome. Mm. The next step. And so I would say in a self-evaluation, if I was working for somebody and I didn't like it, I'd need to ask myself, okay, why am I doing this? For how long am I gonna do this? And what is the outcome? And if I can achieve the desired outcome through this, then it's probably worth staying. But if I can't, then maybe I need to think about it, right? But if I don't know why I'm doing it, and I don't have any idea what the outcome is that I want, it's really hard to stick. Right, right. It's really hard to stick. And people come and go in jobs. You know, you think, oh, you know, I'm going to have, you ain't going to have that boss forever. If they're clowning and acting a fool, believe and trust, they're going to get rid of them or they're going to get bored. They're going to be distracted and they're going to move on. But right. you need to hold on and stay, uh, stay with some stick to itness. Okay, so now the next step. You're okay. at this place and you've made a decision that, you know, you don't want to quit. Mm -hmm. How do you encourage yourself to stay in to win? Well, one of the things I have noticed, um, especially about entrepreneurs, because I am one and I always have been and I hang out with lots of entrepreneurs because they get me, um, is that we need to have some system and it doesn't need to be entrepreneurs, it's everybody really, of encouraging ourselves, which would mean you, you make it through the day and you have some kind of celebration. I don't mean taking yourself out to dinner or having a drink. That's not what I mean, but I mean an acknowledgement like, wow, look at you. You, you sent that email or you got through the day. Like, good job. Good job. Right, right. Yeah. I, I like to do that too. I, I bought myself a kiss, you know, I was like, wow, you know, you really accomplished that. Yeah. Well, I, I say it out loud so that I actually receive it. So I'm not just thinking, oh, that was really good. I say to myself, wow, Robin, good job. You did that. You got that done. You you made it through the day or you finished that project. So it's it's a habit of acknowledging ourselves. And you know what else? I've noticed people are afraid of success. They talk a good game. Oh, I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to lose 100 pounds. I'm going to do this. But there's a lot of people out there, Robin, that are have a fear of succeeding and really getting to that point because they think they've reached a plateau and there's no higher that they can go. Do you find that to be true? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think we self-sabotage a lot when we get close to a goal or when we get closer to a dream or something goes well for us. I, I have watched it over and over. 
um, with friends and, you know, it's easier to see with other people, right? It's right, just, easier. Right. Like, oh, you just did that? Like, why would you do right. that? And I can see it for myself if I'm really paying attention and willing to admit it sometimes. I'm like, wow, that was interesting how you did that so that that could not, no longer happen, right? So April, may I, um, may I talk to you just briefly about the other side of the coin? Absolutely, flip it on me. <laughs> your brain might be interested in knowing. So look, so I have, um, committing has been my superpower. That is like, I am so good, I am loyal, I will commit, I will see something from the beginning to the end. And you know, I've been referred to as tenacious as a bulldog many, many times in my life, because I just won't give up. And it's my kryptonite as well. Um, and so what I know about myself is that I have really had an epiphany recently about how I don't quit when all signs are saying quit. You need to quit now. Mm. And, and what I mean like about that is um, I could look back and tell you stories throughout my whole life where I've had this pattern. So let me give you a quick example. So when I was a kid, we were in Chicago and my dad wanted to be based as a, a pilot in San Francisco. And he said, when we move someday, I'll buy you a horse. I was 11. We moved to, to Northern California and my parents bought a home on a steep hillside and my dad said, Hey Robin, I don't think we're going to be able to get that horse. We'll do something else. Well, guess what? I took that as a promise from my dad. And so he said no, but I refused to listen. And so what did I do at 11? I went outside with a pickaxe, a shovel and a rake, and I tried to clear a hillside and level it out <laughs> by myself wow. because I didn't, I, I refused to believe that he meant no. I went, no, I'm getting that horse. I'm going to do whatever I can. He made a commitment. I'm going to make sure he follows through. Mm. And so I see that as two things. Number one, I didn't pay attention to the red flags, which were, hey, this is not happening. It was like I threw them on the floor and jumped on top of them. Like, I'm not going to see that. And then to prove myself worthy of getting that horse, I cleared property. Mm. And I still didn't get the horse because it wouldn't, I get it now. It didn't make sense. The horse would have been up to its hocks in mud all right. winter long. Right. But, but, you know. but I've done that over and over and over. Somebody makes me a promise in a relationship. Could be, you know, my kids, whatever relationships. It doesn't matter. And it starts to go south. And instead of me acknowledging this isn't working, I really should get out now. I stay. I stay when my body's telling me, you need to get out of this, you need to stop. So to me, there are two sides to quitting. And that's why at the quitting culture that I have, it's you gotta look at both. Like there's a time to do it all the way to the end because it's aligned. It's aligned with who you are and who you are being and what you're meant to do. And there's a time to stop because it's not. And that kind of stick to itiveness is actually detrimental, right? So it's both. To me, it's very much both. So when you pump the brakes and uh, you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, you know what, this really didn't work. You feel self-defeated, you know, you feel deflated. You can. How do you get back on that horse? <laughs> That's such a great question, April. So to me, there's, there's a process here. So I'm all about ending things accountably and intentionally. Right. Right. Rather than just, you know, letting things end and I never have a conversation with myself or someone else about what's happening. It mm -hmm. just kind of like slides. It just slides away. Right. Slips away or just. Eh. But but the better way to do it, quite honestly, for yourself is. So let's just pretend I said I'm not eating sugar anymore. And, you know, two weeks later, I'm in a bag of M&Ms. The caramel ones are really good. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> Don't start me. But okay, so I'm in, I'm in the M&Ms and I'm eating sugar. And I think to myself, geez, Robin, you know, you broke a promise to yourself and that leaves me feeling scattered. I have a loss of self-esteem, lower self-worth. However, I can stop that. I can have a real conversation with myself in which I say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's in the mirror. Maybe it's just out loud. You said you weren't going to eat sugar, but clearly you changed your mind, and it's not a problem at all. I, I'm just going to let myself off the hook. I'm off the hook. I changed my mind. I'm eating sugar. No big deal. You're forgiven. Eat sugar. That changes everything. 
because it's an acknowledgement of I am quitting and I've, that's just what I've decided. I don't need to justify it. I just quit. Not a problem, but I'm kind of forgiving myself. And when it comes to other people, right? Um, I help people have these conversations, which would be, Hey, April, you know, last year we said we were going to walk two mornings a week and, and I really fell off. And, and I realized for myself, I'm not keeping my commitment to you. And the impact that's had on me is I'm afraid to talk to you. And I've kind of isolated myself from you and I'm kind of hiding from you and I don't want to live like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm asking, can we renegotiate? Could we do something different that works for both of us? Right. That's an accountable conversation. That's you. And so when we do that, when we have these important conversations with ourselves or others, there's a, there's a freeing of our brain because what happens when we're, when we're spinning around these things, they wake us up at night. We feel bad. I have someone I needed to call. I promised her I'd call her. And I realized this in this kind of conversation a few months ago, and I was like, Oh my goodness, I'm out of integrity. I didn't call her. And it was waking me up. It was popping into my brain in middle of conversations. Wow. And I, uh, simple. I just need to handle it. Hello, I'm sorry I didn't call you. <laughs> right, right, right. And again, like you said, handle it. But people avoid, they dodge, they don't know how to make a decision, they don't know how to deliver or receive a no. Right. All this is very valid. You, this is how you edit and filter. This is how you weigh it. This is what you find out, you know, again, your integrity level, your sincerity level, um, you know, what you're committed to, what you just don't want to do. Right. And again, it's a great, great discipline for parenting. It is. It's huge. It's really huge. And so I launched the Raising Quit Proof Kids Roadmap back in January, and I had a bunch of parents in it, and they couldn't finish it. And it's less than two hours of content. And that's when I went, oh, my goodness, I need to help parents so they can help their kids. Because if they don't know what it takes and they don't know what it means to be committed and they don't know how to end things that aren't serving and stick with things that do align with them, right. then we're, we're going to not be able to help kids. And yeah. kids, of course, as everyone always says, the kids are our future. Yeah. And we need to help our kids to be, uh, to know what is aligned with them and know what they shouldn't be doing and know when to stay and finish it and know when to say, you know what, this isn't what I can do. It's not, it's just, I'm out of integrity or it's not in alignment. We right. need to teach ourselves so we can help our kids. That's wonderful. So you started a, a great five day challenge. Tell us all about that. Yeah, starting on December 2nd, we're gonna do a five day Facebook challenge and it's in a group called Overdoers Anonymous and you can just go find the group on Facebook, just search for it. And um, it's brand new, <laughs> I just started it. Um, but the five day challenge is going to be really simple. It's like a five to 10 minute video for me every day for five days in a row with five to 10 minutes worth of homework. And then you just post it in the group, what you've been doing and what you've noticed. And the whole idea is let's figure out where you got those un incomplete um, commitments, promises, or agreements in different areas of your life. And let's decide which ones we're going to just simply set aside and end accountably. Because when we do that, we literally have more brain space and your brains will love that right they will, they will love it because i do that i do brain dumps mm -hmm. it's so simple i get a pencil piece of paper or a whiteboard and i just write everything that's in my mind everything that's racing be it the podcast cooking for dinner right. you know, walking the dog or missing my dog whatever the situation is it frees up capacity it frees up space you know, it's over with, it's out, it's in front of you. Now you've got to deal with it. That's yeah. the same thing with bad credit. That's the same thing with finance. That's the same thing with bad relationships, with bad kids, being an enabler, being codependent. When it's right in front of you, you have no option and no choice but to address it. Right. And when you've addressed it, then that's where the spin comes in, right? When we don't address things, when we avoid things. When you know, so and I really believe all this can lead to isolation and depression. If there's enough of it going on, we yep. just don't want to. See, we don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to be seen. We don't want to be in relationship. We just want to kind of like be by oh, ourselves. Want to be held accountable too, right? So we get it out on paper. We know. We look at all the different areas where these things can be going on, and we and we just decide we're going to evaluate and eliminate, and then we can be more on purpose with with the things that are really important to us right. you know the important commitments the ones that are 
actually um, around who we are being and who we want to be in the world and all that other stuff, it, you know, if it can go, my goodness, you, you can really transform. You can, and you can be a much happier brain. Uh, this has been very, very interesting. I mean, it was so simplistic. And when I first talked to you, you said, you know what? I uh, am a coach around a culture of ending quitting. Yeah. I said, ending quitting? What, what are you talking about? I didn't get it. Well, brains, we got it now. And I know, because again, I will quit something. Um, but I'm a little bit more spontaneous, you know, I'm like, okay, I don't want to do with it. I quit and be done with it. I don't do the back and forth. So there's not a lot of gray and I'm working on that. But again, that's a part of the process. That's a part of the learning. Wherever you fall short, that's where you have to fill in the blanks, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And great people like uh, Robin Keen are going to help us do that. Please tell us uh, how to get in contact with you if we want to join the group. And if we want to work with you one-on-one -on -one or have some parents or some kids that need your help. Yeah, absolutely. So you can go get a free course for me. It's about 30 minutes long, and I would encourage you to see it through, finish it. Uh, it's called the Klepto Code, Stop Stealing from Yourself. Oh, that's cute. Yeah, and each of the letters actually stand for something, one part of the process. And you can go to quittingculture.com backslash giveaway. So you can go do that, and I'd be happy to see you in there. Um, you can find me on Facebook. I mentioned the Overdoers Anonymous group. That would be great. Uh, you can also just find me, um, you can just send me an email, robin at quittingculture.com because I do personal coaching. I do accountability. I do mastermind. So I've got something for you no matter what stage you're in. Well, you have just been a wealth of information. I thank you so much. And I'm going to work on that. I'm not too much of a quitter. But again, when I decide to quit, I'm going to go through some of these processes, think it through a little bit more. And, you know, again, it's like my guitar lessons. Back to music. I praise, yes, I do take guitar lessons. And it has been a challenge. I mean, you know, a woman over 50, but I wanted to stimulate my brain. I wanted to learn something new. And I got a great deal on a guitar. And I tell you, I was telling Robin at the beginning, between the... Uh, finger memorization and strumming and trying to keep the time and singing i wanted to quit but i'm yeah. not gonna quit now i'm gonna go in there and i'm gonna dedicate myself to those 15 minutes every day and then next thing you know next time we meet with robin quinn i might be playing a song <laughs> yeah. i want you to show up playing a song i think you should play us a song at the beginning of april all right well that's what i'm gonna do now i'm gonna commit that okay, okay. And I'm not going to renegotiate it. I am going to follow through. Okay, now you heard that, Brains. Now that might be a month from now, but I'm going to follow through and I'm going to win. Like I want you to win here on the edge. That's why I go and find great people with great conversations and different thought patterns and different modalities and things that we struggle with, even the basics, okay? And parenting and saying no and uh, committing to things. That's a big challenge for a lot of people. But I'm glad that you're committed to being here with me on the edge every day, every day. I know who does that podcast every day. We do on the edge. I thank you so much, Robin Keen, for being here. Come back. Keep us informed on what's going on. Brains, I want you to go in. Again, it's F-R-E-E. -E, okay? Mm -hmm. Be all you can be, especially for free. I love you. Robin, thank you so much for being here. And come back and visit us again, okay? Thank you, April. Great to meet you and great to see the brains. All right. Bye, brains. Have a good day, baby.